basically the other side of the word today. <laughs> Clark is with us today. Um, he'll be talking about his new book that is coming out. Um, and it's a UK book premiere, isn't it, Clark? It is. It is, yes. Yeah. So we'll have a presentation from him and then we'll take some questions at the end. Um, but if you do have any, just please put them in the chat in the meantime, if you don't want to lose them, and then we can take them at, um, at the end of the session. Um, just a few notes. Um, that's the, we've got one event, so, sorry, two events in April that we would like to invite you for. Um, one is with Dean Latana. I'm pretty sure if you're, um, if you're not new to this community, you be pretty, uh, you know, Dean for sure. Um, we'll do a Poria workshops um, on the 13th of April. And then right at the end of, of the month, we've got the, um, um, another session on uh, designing fun agile retrospectives. So I'll send you the links in the chat um, for these sessions. And also in case you missed any of those events and you still would like to um, catch up on the slides and what we've been discussing. Um, I'll also ping you the link to YouTube channel where you'll have a view to, to the latest um, sessions that we had. Okay, I think that's it for now. Unless, Karada, you've got any other notes, but I think we can. Yeah, ju just a note that we are recording the session. Yeah. And the session will be published on, uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, in this weekend, I added a couple of uh, video recording of the last two sessions. So stay tuned with the channel to, to see the recording. Yeah. So over to you, Clark. Lovely. Hello, lo everyone. It's, <clears throat> excuse me. It's nice to be here. I had the world's quickest, quickest breakfast because uh, I, I woke up at half three this morning, which was half three your time this afternoon. Uh, if you're in the UK, uh, and I thought, oh, I'm wide awake. And then I fell asleep uh, half an hour before my alarm went off. So it was a mad dash uh, towards the end. But it's, it's lovely to be here. Um, it, nice to see you, Craig, uh, um, all the way from Scotland. I used to see that view behind you uh, most days of the week because I lived in Scotland uh, for, for 20 years before moving back home here to New Zealand. Okay, so, yeah, this is a, a, a little... Uh, book launch. It, it's weird because this would normally be done live um, and I'd actually have copies of the book, uh, but the paperback copies of uh, the, the, the book and um, they, my, I'm the first one to order them and they're somewhere between America and here, uh, hopefully not stuck on a, um, a, a container ship in the uh, Suez Canal. Um, but uh, I'm going to do a wee bit of a talk about the book and get the idea of what's in the book. It's the most powerful thing I know, and also the simplest thing I know. Uh, and it's um, it, 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 it's its origins uh, for me come from Ellie Goldratt in the theory of constraints. Uh, and it's a tool called the evaporating cloud. It was always very mystical, confusing the way he presented it because he sold very expensive uh, courses and consulting where you know you came and you learned how to do it properly I, I, I've just simplified it and I um, uh, just made it a very easy uh, everyday uh, ver version of the tool and people have been using it for years and years and years so what I want to do today um, <coughs> excuse me I, I want you all to get the gist of what the tool is about the general process, and then you'll be able to apply it really easily. If you like rules and lots of instructions, uh, you're not going to get them here. You can read the book and you'll get a few more rules, but this is more the, the way it works, so you get your head around it, so you can think upon your feet. So if you think like in Agile land, um, you know, some people buy instruction books, they go on courses, they get a lot of detailed things, get told what calendar meetings to set up, and that's all really, really useful. Uh, but if you don't kind of get how it works, um, who, who knows what's going to happen? So I want you all to get uh, how this works. And if you get that, you'll actually see it's really easy. Uh, you'll see when you get to my, uh, if, when you get to the book, um, that, uh, and I'm just trying to figure out how to share here at the same time, um, that even dogs do this. Uh, it, it's a very natural process, uh, but we tend not to know how to do it 
when we're faced with hard problems, with easy problems, we, we use it really easily. So I'm just going to go here and share this with you. Okay, can I just get some thumbs up? You can see that. Excellent. Okay, right. I'll press play. And I'm just going to run through this. This is a um, there's a lovely animation that may well be a bit blurry here, but uh, they only last for about um, another three or four seconds here. So I go by the, the, the name. I'm not sure what the proper way of uh, calling it. The tagline, uh, the bottleneck guy, because my last book uh, that did quite well was about uh, bottlenecks and bottleneck management. Um, but this is about bottlenecks of the brain. Bottlenecks, things that are in your head uh, and they slow you down. Uh, and we're going to come up with clever solutions to get around them. And that might sound a bit mystical. It will become clear in just one moment. So, oh, hang on. I can't click on my mouse and expect my iPad to move. So I'll just move these over here. Right. Okay. So that's me. Now, just so you know, um, this is a map of the world. And we recently had uh, New Zealand taken off the map of the world. Um, just because uh, no one's allowed in and no one's allowed out uh, at the moment. The advantage of that is that we're all um, inside this little land here, uh, somewhere uh, down here. Uh, we are uh, allowed out and we have uh, no active COVID stuff going on inside the country. Uh, it's all quarantined. Um, so that's got its advantages, uh, but hopefully we'll all be back on the same map shortly. Right. Now, uh, I just want to give you a quick link here. Uh, see that share.toc.guide? If you go there, you can get a free copy of The Bottleneck Rules, which is my last book. Uh, it is, um, I see a, a thumbs up there. <laughs> That's cool. Um, uh, you can get a free copy of that. Uh, you do go on my mailing list, but if you get the, the, the email that comes out and then immediately click unsubscribe, I will get a note that says you've unsubscribed and I'll hate you forever, but I pretend I still like you. Um, actually, you know, it's, it's very easy. Just go there, do that. If you would like a copy of this new book, which is Corkscrew Solutions, I haven't set up a way of giving it away for free and I'm, I'm not generally doing that. But if you want it, and if anyone's watching this on the, uh, the, the youtube -y thing later, uh, just, just feel free to um, connect with me on LinkedIn and just say, can I have a copy of the book and I'll send you a PDF. Um, I would love you to read it. And uh, if uh, I don't make money from, um, I don't make much money from selling books. Uh, I make that from consulting, et cetera. Um, uh, so if you want a free copy, uh, just shout out LinkedIn, Clark Ching. Um, there's only one of me. Uh, there's a dentist in Canada, um, but apart from him, there's only one of me. Right. Um, yeah, so share.toc.guide. Now, both of these two books here, both of these two, through um, some miracle, not advertising on my part, have both been the second best selling leadership book, book uh, at different times on Amazon.com. Uh, the Corkscrew Solutions, uh, it uh, was the, it, it's just come out. Hang on, I'm going to move my screen so I stop, I keep looking in the right place. That's a bit healthier looking. Um, so yeah, yeah, so just over the weekend, the Corkscrew Solutions was the second best selling leadership book on Amazon.com and the bottleneck rules uh, was before that. Um, and I'm telling you this stuff partly to gloat because I'm delighted. <laughs> it's a lot of work to write a book. And uh, it's really nice when people uh, read it and it came out from a very nice review and an influential uh, newsletter. Uh, it was also the number one creativity book. So it's called Corkscrew Solutions and the subtitle, which isn't on the cover, is How Great Leaders Solve Impossible Problems. Okay, so how great leaders solve impossible problems. And I'm going to show you what seems like an impossible problem uh, and a great leader in just a moment. The good news is that it, it, it's very repeatable once you've learned this little um, process. There's a little gap uh, that distinguishes great leaders uh, and the rest of us. And it's just it's just a process thing. I'm just gonna teach you that. Okay, so I'm intrigued. Ah, now this fellow here, his name is Bob. Corkscrew Bob. And his, um, his last name 
is actually an acronym. That's a mnemonic. Uh, so it's a way of remembering the secret source that I'm going to show you here. Uh, so it's capital B, lowercase o, uh, capital B. And I'll explain why that is uh, as we go along. But I just want you to remember that, that when you get stuck with a seemingly impossible problem, uh, a dilemma, uh, and you just I just want you to think, oh, what would Bob do? Because uh, you can kind of extrapolate everything and remember everything from that little prompting question. And I'm going to tell you about a great leader called Winston Churchill. You may be aware of him and a dilemma he had. Then I'm going to tell you quickly about Roger L. Martin, who's a great thinker and uh and, and, and author, he writes a lot of big books with, with CEOs, big profound business books. And uh, he has given a name to this process. Uh, and he wrote a book in the, the I think the nineties, I, I recall uh, about it, but it, it, was, it was very kind of vague on how to do it. Uh, and then um, I, I read that and I realized I've been doing this really clever process that he'd named integrative, integrative thinking uh, for years. Uh, and I learned it from Ellie Goldratt, the father of the theory of constraints. Right, so Churchill, he's our first hero here. We've got three heroes, he's the first one. Now, if you, um, you, you know, church, everyone knows World War II. Uh, in World War I, um, when Winston was just a young fella, uh, he got made head of the Admiralty. He got put in charge of the, the, the British Navy. And at that stage, you know, you can imagine um, that the ships, they were, that they were coal powered. Uh, ships, most of them, and some of them maybe even still sailed, I, I, I don't know, but we're talking uh, 1910, 1911, he got put in charge of the Navy, and the reason that happened is because they all knew World War I was about to break out, uh, the British Prime Minister knew it, uh, Churchill knew it, they all knew it, the Germans knew it, it was an open secret that everyone hoped wouldn't happen, and it almost kicked off in 1911, when there was a bit of, um, well, Germany ended up sending a, a power, a, sorry, a, a warship into Agadir Harbour in Morocco, uh, which was kind of thumbing their nose at everyone. And the British thought that the Germans were going to use that as their uh, Atlantic naval base. Uh, and everyone got really, really upset. There were lots of negotiations and um, they they were effectively in a, a political war with each other, but they didn't want a real war, so they managed to negotiate themselves out of this. But when this happened, the British Prime Minister uh, at the time said, Winston, even though Winston was only in his 30s at this stage, Winston, you're in charge of the Navy, and your job is to set up the Navy so it can win this inevitable war. And his mission, he was told, was to win a war against Germany. So as you go here, I'm going to present this seemingly impossible problem using this diagram. And if you happen to have seen the evaporating cloud from Ellie Goldratt before, he does it on his side. I do it this way. Uh, I, I find it much more natural and, and a lot of people um, find it natural. If, if I'm using it with people that don't know about the diagram, I don't make a big deal about the diagram. It's just a really interesting way of unpacking and then solving a, um, a seemingly impossible situation, a dilemma. So his mission, he's put in charge, you must win the war against Germany. But then, sorry, I'm trying to watch the animations come out. But then, hang on, sorry, apologies. Um, he's immediately faced with an, a, a, a dilemma. You, you all know the word dilemma means a big problem, right? Um, if you look in the dictionary, it actually means it's a problem where you have to choose between two alternatives where they're either very good um, or very bad. And, and what you find in the real world, you actually get um, small, unimportant dilemmas and you get really big um, world-changing dilemmas, and this is one of those world-changing ones, where Winston had to um, convert, uh, sorry, had to choose between uh, two um, 
alternatives. And the first alternative was to convert to oil. So he had all these ships there. He was told, prepare your navy to go to war and win the war because the war will be won or lost uh, on the seas. And his choice was convert to his warships to oil or, or stick with coal. And it, with, with the wisdom of retrospect, you know, we, we look back and we go, obviously, we're all using oil uh, warships um, and oil everything uh, these days. But back then, um, it was a new technology, but it was fairly proven. Germany was busy building oil uh, uh, liners, uh, and it was expected that at some stage uh, they would start building um, oil warships as well. So the technology wasn't proven, but uh, it, it wasn't an obvious, um, easy choice for them. So the, the, the obvious advantage, though, of oil I'm sure you can figure this out yourself compared to coal, uh, was that they were much more powerful. Oil packs a whole lot more energy density um, uh, for, for the volume. Uh, so oil powered warships will be smaller. Um, they'll be faster. They'll be e more easily maneuverable. They require a whole lot less uh, sailors on the ships. Uh, that really all round, apart from one little thing, but really just so much better um, than anyone else. Plus, uh, Germany was going to have warships. And, and if they, um, they had coal-powered uh, ships, then they would be going to war against a, an enemy who was a lot more powerful, nimble, agile uh, th than they were. So oil was a really you know, obvious choice. Y you, you could imagine uh, people in the Navy coming to Winston and convincing him um, oil is the way of the future. Just ignore everyone else that's saying it's not because, uh, you know, they're just, they're, they're coal mine, mine owners and they've got vested interests. Uh, they are, um, uh, they don't know about oil. They, they're just, you know, they're, they're Luddites, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and Churchill's hearing all of this stuff and he knows all the advantages of oil. However, he also knows there's one really big advantage, uh, disadvantage of oil, a devastating one. And it's actually particularly relevant this, this uh, week, given what happened. Um, the exciting news, it was good to see good news in the, the, um, the uh, you know, real live bottleneck uh, featuring in the, the, the newspapers over the, the, the last few weeks. Um, it wasn't all doom and gloom, it was just a boat that was stuck. But um, back then, uh, the oil, and it still does largely come from Persia, uh, Iran. Uh, so if, um, if, if Churchill uh, had said, go for the oil warships, uh, they would then have, hang on, I just need to move a little thing here, make sure I can see it properly. There we go, sorry about that. Um, if he had said go for the oil warships, they would have created a risky oil supply. Okay, because it would be in Persia, it would either have to come around uh, under Africa uh, on the ships when they transported it, uh, or it would have to go through the Suez Canal. And the Suez Canal is, um, it, it, it is a bottleneck for, for shipping, uh, but it's known in military terms as a choke point. And if you control that, uh, you control a, a uh, the, the destiny um, uh, of, um, you know, the war largely. And if you uh, control um, the oil supply or you don't control the oil supply, then it's very, very dodgy to um, have a Navy that depends on oil. And to make it worse, the oil supply, even if you could secure the journey um, from Persia to England, even if you could secure that, the oil was actually owned by a foreign company and they could end up in a bidding war uh, against Germany and the price of oil would shoot up and uh, the owners of the, the, um, the, the Persian oil company uh, would effectively sell to the highest bidder. So it, can you imagine you go for your, um, you take your left hand option here and you convert to oil, brilliant idea, most powerful ships, but uh, you run out of battery effectively and you're stuck at sea and you've got no power and you're effectively sitting ducks. So really good option, but it's got one really bad 
um, downside. So obviously you, you, you choose the other option, you stick with oil. Um, oil comes from Wales. No, sorry, you stick with coal. The, the, the coal, you know, um, plenty of coal in Wales, there was then, uh, there still is, it'd be a nice, safe, secure fuel supply. So you, you can see that's, that's pretty obvious, right? Um, convert to oil, powerful ships, yeah, but uh, uh, they run out of fuel, um, you can't use them, you lose the war. You stick with coal though, and you have a reliable fuel supply, that's good too, you've got your ships out there, everyone knows how to use them, that's all brilliant. Uh, so you've got the ships out there, but um, the a weak, uh, weak ships compared to what your enemy has. And it would be like that saying in the, um, uh, I remember it from the Untouchables movie, you know, you, you've bought um, a knife to a gunfight. Uh, so either option, as good as they both were on paper, their disadvantages meant that they would lose the war. Okay, so um, that, that's just a frame. This is a really tricky problem. Either way you look at it, uh, you can't win. And you, you could imagine that there's um, our uh, friend Winston. He's been met with people who argue the left-hand side, oil. Then he's been met with people, you know, an hour later, they're arguing coal. They get them in the room and they argue with each other. And what they're doing is they're taking sides in this dilemma. And from Churchill's point of view, they're effectively, they're taking sides, but they're all on the same side. Uh, and that they should be, the, the enemy here, he reframed it as being this dilemma that we just described using this little diagram. Okay, so what he did is he sat down and effectively figured out a solution where we got the two items in the middle. He said, look, whatever it is, uh, a good solution is going to have powerful warships and it's going to have a reliable fuel supply. So if we, we think about this in, like, if it was software development, they, these would be, um, uh, say, perhaps you might want to call them non-functional requirements. And then you've got uh, uh, two solutions um, below them. But let, let's not think of them as solutions. Let's just think of them as options. And what we're going to do, um, or what Winston did, is he looked at each one of those options and then he figured out, are there any other things we have to put in play uh, to get me those two things that are in the middle? So just to absolutely repeat that, I know this is really obvious, but what he did is he looked at the two options and he figured out what he was trying to get out of both of them. And then he said, I'm going to come up with a third way, which gives me the best of both worlds. Okay, so that is, it's fairly straightforward and we do this all the time and intuitively, but um, on harder problems, we don't, we, we, we kind of stop before we actually, um, we don't solve the problems uh, like this when they're harder, more, more methodically. That, that's all I'm showing you. Now, I just use an expression that I just want to, um, B-O-B, remember that's corkscrew Bob in the middle there? Um, Bob stands for best of both. Because what you want is that old expression, you want the best of both worlds. Okay, so what I've done so far is I've just described a really, a true, a very, very significant um, and important dilemma. And it's not like Churchill gets, is the only person who gets dilemma. We all suffer um, from dilemmas. Um, I'm sure there's been at one stage where you've had a, a, a sort of, well, do I wear a mask uh, or do I not wear a mask? Um, do I get a vaccine? Do I not get a vaccine? You, you can imagine those, um, those the ships that were, were in the queue waiting to get on to the Suez Canal uh, and they had a dilemma. Do I stay in the queue and hope that they fix it or do I um, break out of the queue uh, and head down around through Africa instead? Uh, we have dilemmas, all of us, every day. We, we live a, you know, those choose your own adventure books that you, you used to get and you get things there now. Um, turn to page 34 if you want to do this. But if you want to do that, turn to page 92. Um, we all live in a choose your own adventure world where every day we're faced with uh, dilemmas. Most of them aren't this big or world changing, um, but some of them are very big for us. And, and when they are, we tend to treat them as impossible. We go, I can't solve that. And then we just forget about them and we just live with the consequences. So what Winston did 
is he first looked at the coal option and he said, look, is there any way I can stick with coal and also make the ships far more powerful? And it didn't take him long to figure out that, that they were already trying to do that. Um, and, and, and it just wasn't going to happen. Coal just was a, an inferior fuel. Uh, so he looked at the other option and said, is there a way that we could convert to oil, which would give us the powerful warships, like, like you see in the diagram here, um, and also, oops, I'm sorry, I need to, I've given away the secret there, I think, and also have a reliable fuel supply. That's kind of straightforward, isn't it, right? You say, well, I want to stick with coal, but it's unreliable, so how do I make it reliable? Um, and what he did is he bought 51% of the Persian oil company. He figured out that he could make the, um, through military means and whatever they needed to, they could um, secure the supply of fuel from a logistical point of view, but he couldn't control who the Persian oil company would sell it to. So he went to uh, the prime minister and said, support this bill, please. Uh, and it was a bill in two senses, and it was a very, very big, expensive, multi-million pound bill uh, to get the money to buy this oil company. Uh, and they bought 51% of it. Uh, and by doing that, they ended up with the two things in the middle that we wanted. He got the best of both worlds, powerful warships and a reliable fuel supply. That Persian oil company uh, went on to be called British Petroleum and it's now known as BP. Uh, so that's where BP came from. So now if you're looking at this, I'm hoping you're doing two things going one is going oh that's really obvious um uh and then the second one is going oh yeah but it, it wasn't obvious a few minutes ago um, and, and but by me unpacking this and, and making it very visual and simple and taking all of the details out of it it, it just made it very very easy for you to see the story and and it's got an obvious conclusion um but when you're in the midst of something like this, and Churchill would have been the same, when you've got people taking sides, oil, 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 coal, 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 arguing with each other, and you're acting like referee um, in a game of um, uh, military uh, uh, football, when you're refereeing two sides, and they're all meant to be on the same team. Uh, what he did, which wasn't probably obvious to anyone else at the time, is he sat down, and he just thought two things. One is, what do I get out of each option? And then how do I get the best of both worlds? And then he used his clever brain to come up with solutions that solve for that. Trouble for us is that it, it, whenever you do this, whenever you go through this process and you come up with something, um, you, you will know when it becomes obvious, you go, oh, it's obvious you've, you've, that you've um, done most of the work to solving the problem. Uh, but then after you've done that, about 10 minutes later, you go, she's a bit stupid now because it's so obvious. But there's this point before it's obvious, um, which is when you have a dilemma. And then when the new option um, resolves the dilemma, um, the solution is obvious and you no longer have a dilemma. You've just solved a seemingly impossible problem. Okay. Um, now, Churchill called this style of thinking, corkscrew thinking. Uh, and when he went on to, um, when he went on to uh, be, be prime minister in World War II, he set up uh, a bunch of different operations that weren't, you know, the normal military stuff with people who had what he called corkscrew minds. Th these are the people that thought for the fastest way from point A to point B uh, wasn't a straight line, basically. And this is where the term came from. They would corkscrew around to try and get to point B. These were quirky people. Um, you probably heard of some of them, Alan Turing. Um, uh, there, there's a, a chap that's in a movie that's not been released yet uh, called James Bond, who was based on a lot of them. Ian Fleming worked for... Uh, during World War II for the uh, guy that was in charge of the, 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 the British spies. Uh, and he based James Bond character on a lot of the people that they work with. 
His boss said that the corkscrew mind, uh, this ability to think differently from everyone else was the, the, the key to being a good spy. And it was like their recruitment criteria. The special operations executive, um, they were uh, full of um, these, these people. And what's the other one there? Operation Mincemeat, where they come up with a cunning D-Day trick to fool the German um, uh, military into believing that they were going to do their D-Day invasion uh, in a different place. These all came from people uh, who thought differently, who solved uh, different problem, uh, problems differently to everyone else. Uh, and they were known back then as having corkscrew minds. It's a really cool thing to have a corkscrew mind, and it's quite likely that you have an inner corkscrew mind there, but the world does tend to favour uh, the, the, the straight line uh, thinkers. But if you want something done that's already been solved, straight line thinkers are very good at delivery. If you want something that hasn't been solved and seems impossible, corkscrew thinking is your key. Anyway, so um, Churchill had a corkscrew mind um, and uh, most great uh, leaders do um, and he put it into life uh, in the real world uh, in World War II and a lot of the clever clever stuff that came out of it came from him. Now, a second hero is this chap uh, and his name is Professor Roger L. Martin. Now, interesting thing about him is that uh, he was an academic uh, who's made a lot of money by studying very, very, very um, great leaders, great, great business leaders. He's written books with, um, uh, you know, about huge, you know, strategy books that every CEO reads and, and quotes. Uh, and he was also voted the number one management thinker in the world in 2017 by some influential website. Um, uh, he was the Dean of um, Management at the Rotman School of Management. Uh, but all that kind of stuff is boring because I think his greatest discovery is that he discovered that what I've just shown you that process, that all great leaders do it. Because when he was young, uh, he went out and he, he, he interviewed loads of great leaders and, and he said to them, um, no, he studied them. He said, what, what do they do? What makes them different from everyone else? And what he came up with is this quote that you can find in the Harvard Business Review. Now, I'll read it, but then I want to unpack it because it's written for, it just got a lot of big words in one uh, sentence. So it needs a bit of unpacking. So he said that all great leaders share the disposition and the capability to hold two diametrically opposing ideas in their heads. So you saw this with Churchill. Um, he had two opposing ideas and he held them in his head, in their head. But then what he says, um, and then without panicking or simply settling, and I would add to that, and without just arguing, uh, about both sides, um, they're able to produce a synthesis that is superior to either opposing side. So let me just, just play that back again, because that's exactly what Churchill did. Um, he was faced with a dilemma, which is this top line here. Um, I have two opposing ideas, right? Oil or coal. Um, and then rather than simply settling for one alternative, or panicking and having lots of arguments and stuff, they produce a synthesis, that they create um, a, a third solution that gets the best of both worlds. So this is what he described as the behavior that distinguished great leaders from everyone else, including good leaders. So if you think of from good to great, um, this was the one skill that took people um, in his investigations. So he wrote about this, and because he's academic, he gave it a really academic, very clever name, integrative thinking. Right. The trouble, in, in his first book, which had, I think, one of the cleverest book titles um, uh, I've ever seen, it was uh, The Opposable Mind. You know, when we have opposable thumbs and it makes us human. He said that The Opposable Mind, and he, and he did this. But, um, and he wrote this lovely little book that described this idea, but it wasn't, wasn't what we call actionable. 
Uh, in fact, a lot of people would read it and they go, I love the idea, but how? Uh, he's since gone on to write another book about 10 years later with a, a colleague um, and, he, and he did a lot of executive MBA training on it. We taught people a, um, a big complicated process uh, and, and I don't, I mean that respectfully, it's, you know, so um, it, this is what they needed. So my version, what I've shown you here uh, is also used by great leaders to, to solve problems um, and come up with clever solutions. But it's also used just by everyday people. And, and I use this every day in my mentoring and coaching work. Um, every day we, we do these diagrams, these clouds. Uh, I try not to make a big deal about the tool, um, but we use them uh, and I call my version of this everyday integrative think sorry, in everyday integrative thinking, and um, so, which spells edit, E D I T, uh, and, and I like the word edit. It's not a lightly chosen uh, acronym um, because what you're doing effectively is you're kind of writing down what your current situation is, uh, just like you would say if you're writing out um, a, a problem in text, and then you go through and you change the words. And maybe add a few more more words. So it's actually like editing a situation. I'm going to come in and edit your current situation, and I'm going to create a, a new words, um, tweak a few words here, and come up with a new solution. Uh, and when you think of it that way, it, it's just it's like rewriting your future. So he there um, made a huge contribution to this because he gave us a word that um, that the sorry a phrase integrative thinking that fits really, really well uh, with business people and CEOs and the like. So we're just doing a, a far simpler uh, everyday version of that, that I think is just as powerful. Now, I didn't invent this. It came from this chair, this, this chap, my um, ultimate hero, uh, Ellie Goldratt. Uh, it came from this book, It's Not Luck, except the problem with this here is that, that when he wrote that book, he came up with a... Ellie was just an ideas guy, a very brilliant ideas guy, who, who solved, he, he thought, he was an integrative thinker naturally, and he came up with things, he came up with the goal. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you can see a picture of me at the moment, but I have five copies of it um, on my, when I just set up my bookshelf, I found I owned five copies of it a couple of weeks ago, and I put them up there because it's the best book in the world, even though I can't convince people to read it at the moment. Um, it's Not Luck was his, his, the sequel to that, uh, and it had even more really, really brilliant ideas. And the cloud, the, this little diagram was hidden in it, uh, in the book, um, and, it, and, it, and it didn't really teach you how to use it. And there was also quite a lot of mystery around it. Uh, and, and, and when Ellie talked about it, he had a lot of almost mythology and he had a lot of backstory around it that made it feel really, really complicated. Uh, but th what, what was most interesting is that for, for me, when I look back at that, uh, I, I got into the theory of constraints after he'd done this work. And, and what I didn't realize until recently is that, that, you know, this is 20 years ago. He'd been working on this stuff since the 70s. And he had sat down. Um, when he wrote the goal, he, he wrote it to sell software, a, a software program um, that was used by Ford and GM and all of those ones to schedule their factories. And it was a really expensive software, but it required that you break some accounting rules. So he wrote the goal. It's full of accounting stuff to convince the people who sign off and purchase orders for multi-million dollar purchases um, to break their accounting rules. And, and when he did that, people untangled his, um, his software's clever methodology um, that was actually really quite simple and they implemented it without buying the software. So his business went broke. Uh, and so he sat down and goes, well, I need to start a new business. And he goes, well, I think different to everyone else. And so he sat down and he just, watched himself when he was solving problems and figured out what to do. And he came up with um, this thing called the cloud. My mentor was one of the people that, um, that, that, that worked through his scribblings and turned it into process. But when I learned it and when they were putting together this book, they, it was all new. Um, and then over the years, what we found is that TOC people uh, come back to this cloud uh, tool as being the one that they come back to time and time and time again. It's just a really, really simple tool, but it was kind of like at the Beatles, if they had done um, uh, their best song and put it on a, um, and hadn't even bothered putting it on the B side of a, sing a single, um, but they're hidden it in one of their least popular albums. 
Um, this one here deserves to be, you know, like a, a number one tool that you use every day. And I'm over explaining at the moment. So uh, I'm just going to show you there. That's his version of what the cloud looks like. Um, I, I just have just taken it and, and just turned it this way. Um, his version uh, works really well. I think if you are Israeli and, and maybe you, it works well with the way you write. Um, I've found a lot of people um, say they prefer the, this sort of vertical uh, approach. It's just easier to work with. Um, and there's another bit that makes it easier to work with. I'll show you where the vertical style actually came from. It came from this guy here, Bob. I was off doing a, on, on a drive one day and I wanted to help a friend resolve a, um, a seemingly impossible problem. Uh, and we um, didn't have anything to, to, to draw, um, sit down and draw this thing. Uh, we're up in the Scottish Highlands uh, and we, the, 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 you know, there was a pub up there, but I didn't really want to stop there. So I said, why don't we just use our, um, our, our, our body parts and we'll keep it safe for work. Um, so right, you, you've got an impossible problem. So let me just play this out because it's a really helpful mnemonic. Um, it, we use this language already. So um, on the left hand, you've got two options, right? And we always already use this option. On the one hand, we could switch to oil. On the other hand, we could stay with coal. So see how that's just a natural, we, we just naturally um, do this. We, we, we talk about on the one hand, on the other hand. So the two options that you're torn between um, are just, they just sit on your hands. Um, and if you draw this diagram out, I refer to the, the bottom uh, two boxes as the hands. If on the other hand, uh, you wanna lift it up a bit and you're thinking, what do I get out of these? And that's the question you ask. What are the benefits I'm trying to get out of each hand? And you lift it up a level um, and then think of these as higher things. Think of them as, as like Atlas who carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. So you've got two weights on your shoulders, two heavy things. And then think of the top one, the top box. Just think of that as your mission or, or just if you want to place it somewhere in your body, just say that's like the needs of the, the, of my, the head. That's where I'm leading to. That's the, 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 the head. Just think of it as the mission. So you've got on the hands, uh, and then you've got the shoulders, and then you've got the head. Often I don't bother filling out what the head is, because um, it's obvious or, what, what, um, or or not necessary, but sometimes it's very useful for helping you frame actually what you're trying to do. So if you think like in software terms, um, it, it, the head kind of defines your scope. Uh, the shoulders define your requirements, uh, and the solutions are on the two hands. Now, just to take that one, um, one level further, we always know, we say, oh no, we want to start with the requirements first, you know, if we're building software. We want to understand the requirements, but actually there's a thing where you, you, you need to actually start with the solutions. And they, um, when you're in a dilemma, a tricky situation, you often don't know what the requirements actually are until you look at each option, each solution, and ask, what do I get out of that? So we tend to, it's very difficult to try and build it top down. You want to start and build bottom up typically. So I'll just run through the process really quickly. Um, so this is the process. You can define your mission. Um, if it's blank, you go, oh, okay, but um, it's really useful. You saw uh, Winston, uh, win a war against Germany. Um, so that's your first step. The second step is to take the two conflicting options and just remember these are the hands and you go, well, on the one hand, I could do this. On the other hand, I could do that. Or you might say, I'm torn between two things. You might say, I'm stuck on the horns of a dilemma. Uh, you might say, I want to do this, uh, which is on the one hand. Um, but, but on the other one, you also might say, but I don't want to do that. So there could just be the opposite. One is actually do something. And the other option is actually to not do it. And not doing something is also a choice. So you've got two choices on the one hand, on the other hand. The third one, identify the benefits of each option. So what do I get out of this? This is quite hard. Um, uh, sometimes it's really obvious. Sometimes you have to think a bit. And sometimes you have to type out several options. You know, just like when you're writing a paragraph to, to send to someone and it's a bit tricky, you might take two or three goes at getting it right until you go, no, that's actually what we're chasing. Now, th this um, process going from two to three, I call that up thinking. It's just a play on words. It's what you do before you think up solutions. 
So up thinking. Um, and then once you've done your up thinking, you think up your new options. And that's essentially the process. Now, I'm going to finish in just one moment uh, and we have some questions, but I, I just wanted you to notice here how simple it is. You start with the hands. Actually, you know, the first thing is you recognize I'm torn between two options. I'm stuck on, on the one hand, on the other hand. So you start with the hands. It's easier if you can write them down and put them into words. And then you go, what do I get out of them? And that's up thinking and it's figure out the benefits um, that they will give you. Uh, and they sit on your shoulders. And then the diagram, they sit on the shoulders. And then once you've got them, you just look and effectively you cover up the bottom row in your mind and you go, okay, now if I were to take one of them, how could I get both benefits? How could I get the best of both worlds? How could I BOB, Bob? Um, and you come up with options for that. And then you switch to the other side and go, well, um, same process again. How can I get Bob for that as well? Now, I just want to finish on this one. Um, if you find this interesting, you probably know enough to feel comfortable doing it. Um, if you linked in to me or if you want to buy the book, you're welcome to. Um, uh, LinkedIn, you're free, free to get a, a PDF. It's um, happy, absolutely happy either way. Uh, you get more detail on this, more nuance, and you better play back what you've just learned here. And, but then you get more steps on, on um, how to actually do this stuff. It's a really short book. Uh, and the book, I could have easily written a book that was five times longer, but I wrote something that was small because I want people to get the gist of this, which is you start with two hands, you figure out what the weights on your shoulders are, and then you ask, how do I get the best of both worlds? And this is an options making process. So we start. This is really important, I think, though it, it may be obvious to you. It wasn't obvious to me for a long time. We start with two conflicting options on our hands, and we end with two or more non-conflicting options. So we, if they conflict, we have a dilemma. So we create new options that don't conflict, and we no longer have a dilemma. Right, I am going to stop sharing, here we go, and we're back. Amazing. Um, do we have any questions to Clarkton? Well, actually, I, I have a couple of observations, Clark. <laughs> cool. Yeah, just uh, to to confirm what you you described about Winston Churchill. And in after listening your uh, presentation, actually, I let me say I completely understand another strategy that Winston Churchill act in World War One oh, yeah. in in the role of uh, Minister of Navy. That actually, when the situation in the Western uh, border was absolutely stuck, you know, for the trenches and what else, nothing moves in that border. Mm -hmm. An idea that uh, came from Winston Churchill was to open a second front on the eastern side where the Russia can help. And oh. actually, they prepare a mission uh, to, to send some uh, a part of the army uh, soldiers in the eastern side. And uh, actually, it was not a good story. I don't know if you know that, but uh, uh, many of the soldiers actually were coming from Australia and New Zealand. Yes, I do know the story. Yeah, the Gallipoli yep. defeat and what else. But uh, it's, a, it's a bad event, but actually had a very strong strategy that failed in that situation. But from the strategic perspective, it was absolutely something that we should try. Mm. So again, very probably after your presentation, <laughs> he had this, this dilemma, okay, that he want to overcome in the Western mm -hmm. front and the solution could be, okay, let's open a second front to divide the strength of the, um, uh, of the German and Austria armies. And so maybe yes. we can do that. And this was, yeah. uh, uh, so thank you for, for your insight because 
given your presentation, now I can understand how we arrived to that solution. And, and this is, there's, so, this, so um, with this stuff, um, there, there are other ways to come up with this, um, but uh, it, it, when you're really stuck and you don't know what to do, you've got a powerful thing, uh, you know, powerfully torn between options or and one option might even just do something, keep fighting here, um, uh, trying to figure out the other option. Um, uh, is, is just trying to figure out what, what it is. It's just, it's just really powerful. So most of the work you do with this is actually figuring out what's in those middle um, boxes, the, the, the shoulders. Uh, Winston Churchill, um, what, what, what he did uh, uh, with, with the Anzac thing, he's got a whole lot of things where he was um, not the best person uh, uh, in history, but there was also there's some stuff that were um, where, where he kind of uh, was. And I suppose that's the, the problem with being a great leader. You're going to win some. Uh, and, and you're going to lose some. Uh, New Zealand uh, and Australia lost a lot of uh, uh, young men. In yeah, the, a generation. Um, they lost a generation. Yeah, yeah. And we, we, but I suppose um, that uh, it's, it's the price of war. And mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. So, so uh, can I tell you another, just a little, um, uh, little quote um, from uh, FDR, um, because. Um, the, the great leaders, they do tend to think this way. They don't just argue one point of view that they try to uh, get something here. And, and it's not actually, um, it's just a little silly thing, uh, but it might indicate uh, that it's kind of a looseless, looseness of, of mind about being a corkscrew thinker, where you're willing to explore different options uh, and you're not fixed just on one thing. And it can be a curse because as I've practiced this more, I think I've become more open-minded uh, about things and, and and it can be it can be quite annoying with people if they want an argument <laughs> um but what, once upon a time uh fdr was uh stuck um uh no he, his, his his speech writer was stuck uh because he, uh, fdr was supposed to go give a speech uh at some big uh convention or something and it was on an important topic and fdr hadn't chosen which side of the debate he was going to go on. So what he did, uh, the speech writer went to him and said, look, I need you to, to choose um, a, a side, take a side, because I have to write this thing here. So FDR didn't know what he was going to do. So he said, oh, um, tell you what, you write me two papers, one taking each side, right? Which is really clever thinking. Go away, get the arguments for both sides, and 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 write them persuasively, and then bring them back to me, and I'll pick a side. So it goes away, slaves away. Um, must be an interesting thing where you can argue the both sides of an argument, like a debating team does. Uh, pick pick a side, write an argument. So he sat down and he wrote these things two back, two things back. Um, comes back and he gives them to FDR, and he sits down and he very carefully reads through this one. You know, okay, good. Then he very carefully reads through this one, right? Okay, and he picks up and says, "I like this one. And I also like this one." Um, so can you go away and write a third paper, uh, which blends the two together, please? So he effectively delegated the integrative thinking, uh, the the getting the best of both worlds to the speechwriter, um, and. And I like that. It's a good way of delegating. But it, can you then imagine the speechwriter going, oh, wow. Uh, so he had to go away and effectively come up with a third option that got the best out of both worlds. I, I, I like to, I, I love that approach. It, it's, it's much slower um, uh, than, than just arguing um, and taking a side uh, and losing the benefits of the other side. Um, but I, wouldn't it be great? I, 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 I like to think whether he's your hero or um, your enemy, Jeff Bezos, get, he gets his, uh, uh, his, his executives to sit down and write six page memos, um, very well written, um, well argued um, things there. I like to think that, uh, um, that he, he actually instills some of that behavior there, there too, because all, all great leaders do. We want the best of both worlds, go away and come up with a solution that keeps everyone um happy yeah okay um we've got one question from uh carole from germany um if you can unmute yourself and maybe ask the question if your microphone works 
and if you've got clothing on. <laughs> yeah. If not, I can actually read your question there if you if it would be easier for you. My mic doesn't work. Doesn't work. Cool. Okay. That's. Um, so, uh, do you want me to read it? Yeah, go for it, Claire. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Carola from Germany. Hello there. Uh, says this sounds to me like something one person, the leader, does. But can this also be used in a team, working collaboratively to figure out the bob? Yeah. 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 It can. Um, it's uh the uh, the reason i start with churchill is because it is an example of a great leader doing it uh the second example i have in my book is my dog um having a dilemma and it was a real dilemma we took her to the beach one day my wife walked that way with the food uh, which she uses for training i walked that way and i found a pine cone and we both turned out at the same time uh and uh we um uh, I shouted out, Georgie, Georgie, because her name's Georgie, um, come and get the pine cone. And the dog looks at me, all excited. And then she um, hears on the other side, uh, Georgie, Georgie, come and get some food. And the dog was stuck. Oh, on the one paw, do I go to the food? On the other paw, do I go to the pine cone? Uh, and she was stuck in the middle of a dilemma. And she very, very cleverly did what is one of the classic uh, dilemma busting solutions. She decided to do both, but um, she would do one first and then one, one, one after. So she went for the food first, obviously, being a dog, and then came to me um, five seconds later and ate the pine cone. So, so we, we all do this. And, and when you're in a team, uh, it helps to have a facilitator, but it doesn't have to be a leader. Because um, sometimes a leader, uh, in fact, I, I've got a, a long a, a, a team I'm working with at the moment um, that they're in Australia and I'm leading a, a problem solving uh, session for them through three or four hours this afternoon. And we will use these tools because they are a little bit at war with each other. Um, and, and this is just a process. So you need someone to facilitate the process. You say, oh, look, um, rather than letting people run off and argue one side uh, extensively, and then the other side counter uh, argues um, uh, and argues their side, you sit down and you go, Right. Um, okay. So we, we've got two positions here, right? We've got on the one hand, on the other hand. Okay, cool, cool. Right. Now let's just, just problem solve this. Uh, it doesn't have to be the leader. It could be a facilitator. Uh, sit down and go, okay, right. What do we get out of that side? Da -da 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 -da. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Now don't, don't, we, don't, we don't need all the details. We, we, we got those, right? Just what do we get out of that? Right. Okay, cool. Okay, now what, what do we get? And you, you guys, just, just let's, let's see what we get out of it. Okay, right, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah okay, don't, 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 just let the guy finish. Okay, good, good, good. Right, now swap to the other side. Now, what do you guys, ah, oh, no, 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 you guys, you had your chance. Just wait, 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 wait just a sec. Um, I just want to hear the whole story. Da, 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 da. Okay, now, so let, let's sum those up. So you lift, you do this up thinking, and you think, you find the benefits, that the, the two weights on the shoulders that they're trying to go. Okay, right, right, now. You all know this problem really well. You all know it really, really well. You, you, you know both arguments, right? Because you've been arguing about this. You know both sides of the argument. What we want to do is have a look at your side and see if we can get the benefit um, that the other side thinks that you're missing or the thing that you're jeopardizing. Okay, right. Um, it gets difficult because they will instinctively start arguing for their side and you just bring them back and say, no, we want to see, is there a way? And, and then you just, um, you, so you facilitate it. So it's a nice thing, but you use it around the cloud. Sometimes you might get two or three clouds and you just draw them out separately. But um, you, you probably heard of Dan Ariely, the, the, um, who writes a lot about psychology and um, biases and stuff like that. He describes how people make decisions differently when they're in a hot state of mind versus when they're in a cold state of mind, you know, which is um, a, a quick analogy would be uh, that you're better off not shopping for food uh, just before dinner time um, because you're in a hot, you know, you're, you're, you've got, um, you're not completely logical about it. Uh, you've got a bias going on there, which is I'm hungry. Um, and, and we had the same thing when we are arguing um, so we just need to have a nice way of, of, of calling things down and say, let's follow our process. Let's get the two sides, figure out what we get out of both, and then we'll try and come up with a win-win. If you want a, um, a bit more detail on how to do that, there's a classic book 
from the 70s, uh, which I'm sure is where Ali Goldra actually got his thinking from, um, called Getting to Yes. You, you've probably heard of it. Um, really easy little book to, to do. And, and they say, um, uh, they say, separate the positions from the interests. So the positions are the two options on the hand. Here's my position, do this. Uh, here's my position, do that. Mm -hmm. So they're the positions. The interests, um, and it's called interest-based problem solving, are what's on the shoulders. It's what you want to get out of each of those. So that's the classic advice for negotiating. Um, it's the first one. And, and if you're in a, um, that, that top box, which I kind of dismissed a little bit, the, the mission, if you're arguing as a group, um, that becomes a mutual objective. It's the thing that actually ties you all together. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're arguing all about um, the, the coal power thing. But really, um, the thing that's tying us together, the mutual objective, the mutual purpose is that we want to not lose. Or we want to win this war. Yeah, so that's a rather long um, uh, answer. Uh, but yes, it can be used with teams. Um, but like all stuff, uh, it's a process and... Um, just having the tools, it's very, the problem with this team is that they actually, you've got hundreds of people using TSC uh, and, and they're really, really good at it. Um, but it, 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 um, sometimes it's easy just to use the tools alone uh, and not practice the, the, the behaviours that go around it. Um, very, very, very common. Any other? Yeah, there is one more question in the chat from Augusta. Um, the microphone doesn't work either. So let me just read it out. Uh, what you mentioned about being able to hold two, two conflicting ideas in one's mind and be able to find a way to merge them stuck the cord. I recognize yep. that I often tunnel focus on one option and drop the other one. Any tips on how to train and hold to the two ideas and not panic? Yes, yes, yeah, okay. So. Um, the really important thing is here, uh, and I'm going to ask you all to do this. Right? I'm going to get, I've already given you the prompt. So you saw Corkscrew Bob, right? He's actually the hero. He's not the hero. He's guide. He's the guide. He's the Yoda character. He's kind of like a cross between Yoda and Microsoft Clippy. Um, you know, he's, he sits here and he's just, just imagine he's sitting on your shoulder and he's, he's sitting, he could be a she. I, I, I actually don't know. I haven't drawn the diagram that far down. Um, uh, so, Micros uh, sorry, uh, Corkscrew Bob sitting there. Um, and then what I want you to do, all to do, is just notice the next time you're thinking about something and it's not an easy choice. Okay, so that means you have a dilemma. It might not be the world's biggest dilemma. If it was easy, like chase the pine cone or go to food, and you, I'll, I'll do that one first and that one later, it, it won't linger in your mind. But when you've got something and it's sitting in your head and you're worrying about it and it just comes back and it, and it might just be bugging you a little bit, you go, there's, there's a decision I have to make and I haven't made it because it's not easy, which means you have a dilemma. And you will find that you, you I, I imagine some of you are already um, doing this. Uh, there'll be bits that make you kind of look that trigger you. You'll be arguing one side. Um, you'll be arguing the other side. Um, so, so you just, the first step is to notice it and then ask, what would Bob do? And then what Bob would do is say, look, um, draw it out. It's just a diagram, right? So and there's two meanings to draw it out, though. One is to literally draw it out. So um, I've got two boxes here. OK, what's the thing here, right? What's the other one? OK, write that down. OK, cool. You, you, you've done um, uh, four-fifths, no, two-fifths two of the, the cloud just by identifying the options, right? And go, OK, what, what do I get out of each of them? Okay, I get that. Do I need to fill out the top box? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, now just sort of, okay, so I've got this and, and you, you've drawn it out in two meanings. One is physically, you've drawn it. The other bit is that you've drawn it out of your brain. You know, the, the, the ideas, the bit is, it's an argument that you're having with yourself over time, quietly in the back of your brain. And what you want to do is draw it out and actually make it explicit. I mean, once it's explicit, um, the moment you've got the shoulders, 80, 90% of the time, um, you, you solve the problem. You just go, oh, fuel supply. Yeah, of course, of course. The problem isn't the sewers thing. It's that, that, that we don't own it. They could, we could get in a bidding war. Oh, cool. 
buy the company um, or something less um, expensive, hopefully in your real world. Yeah, so there. <laughs> um, notice dilemmas. That's the first thing. And then ask, what would Bob do? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> okay, I think and the last question for today, probably, uh, from Corrado. Does this approach work if you have more than two options? Yes, yes, it does. But the funny thing is, um, I've never really had more than two options. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, I might have two clouds. Uh, I might have two of the diagrams. Uh, and they might be related to each other. But um, yeah, this is a question that always comes out, uh, especially with us clever sort of, you know, computery people, or, you know, we want a complete thing. You could draw a cloud with three options, uh, um, uh, three, three arms, if you like, um, and you could do it with four or five or six. It kind of gets a bit complicated, but then you could ask the same question uh, for each of them. What do I get out of them? Uh, and they'll lift up. You'll probably have... Um, fewer um, fewer uh, shoulders uh, than you think you, you will. Um, but just think of those as the requirements uh, and then you can solve for those requirements. But I've never, I, I've, I've often answered that question and said you can do it, but I've never had to do it. Um, and I'm probably one of the more prolific users of these things. It's almost always between two options. Awesome. Thank you, Clark, very much. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, that you You're very welcome. Here. And I learned a lot. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Yeah, amazing cool. session. I really love it. Yeah. You're very and, welcome. And don't forget, um, link, LinkedIn, if you want a copy of the book, um, uh, read it. And if you want to share it with anyone, feel free. Um, Ah, oh my God, John, John. So this is the first time I've actually seen um, my, my, my a paperback because um, the cover didn't exist till last Friday. Hey, John, could you send me a photo of that? Um, in uh, in a evidence. real world situation, please. That's really cool. So you made my day. It's real. Awesome. Okay. okay. So happy ending, I would say. Happy ending. <laughs> Indeed. Thank okay. you for joining. Thank you, Clark, for sharing. Please, Ula, go ahead, go ahead. No, I think we can close it. Um, have a lovely evening if you're in Europe. Have a great day if you're in New Zealand. Um, have a great afternoon if you're in the US. <laughs> and hope to see you soon. Thank you for joining the session, everyone. Yeah. See you next time. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Thanks, Ula. <laughs>